My family illegally emigrated from Mexico to the United States when I was six years old. At the age of 21, I decided to come back to my home country, ignorant as I was of its culture, after concluding I would rather be free in my third world country than live a life of shame and illegality in someone else's. It has taken me nearly 10 years to accept and start to understand the shock and far-reaching consequences this transition had on my life and spirit. Far from integrating into this new culture, I recoiled from it and tried to maintain my American mindset and ideals. The issue I'm struggling with now is my newfound sympathy towards nationalist ideas and the tricky position it puts me in. I identify as neither American nor Mexican, but the hard fact of my citizenship leads me to conclude that I should fight in the interests of my homeland against the corruption of its leaders and the larger globalist agenda. That's from Sebastian. Oh, hey, Sebastian. How are you doing? Hi, Stefan. I'm, I'm doing great. <laughs> Thanks. What a, what a fascinating story, and, and thank you so much for calling in to, to share it. Is there anything that you wanted to add to um, what you wrote? Um, yeah, well, just right, just before I do that, I just wanted to, uh, you know, thank you. I've been listening to you for, um, you know, over 10 years. <laughs> so, right? On, wow. Yeah. Holy. On and off. How cool. On and wait, off. Wait, 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 wait. What was that last part? On and what? No, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there have been periods when I haven't had a computer or a smartphone, so. All I, right. I mean, if you're lost on a desert island, you are forgiving for not taking your daily dose of the big chatty forehead. So, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I think you're the closest thing I've had to a father figure for for the longest time, and I really don't know where I'd be without you, so I do want to thank you. Uh, Maybe in America, but I appreciate it. It's very, very kind. And you know it's <laughs> funny? I mean, I've heard that sort of uh, the father figure reference, but because I still feel approximately 12, um, <laughs> it feels uh, cool. Uh, it feels cool. All right. So, yeah, is, is there anything else you wanted to add to before we, we, we dig in? Um, yeah, well, I mean, um, so, so, I mean, I, I, I feel like... Um, it's it's awful, you know. Um, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot, um, and I think immigration can have just such an awful effect upon uh, people. And I think that the biggest effect is that loss of a cultural identity. You know, mm. uh, um, I feel I, I do feel like that's something that's missing uh, in my life, um, uh, which may not be so important for everybody, but for me, uh, I really don't feel like I ever. Uh, fit in in the U.S. Uh, because I was an immigrant, uh, and I we immigrated when I was six. So, uh, you know, I was always kind of Well, awkward, sorry, but... technically you weren't an immigrant, right? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I was immigrated there. I didn't immigrate there. <laughs> no, no, but, but Im immigration is usually considered a legal act, right? Oh, okay. Um, right. Yeah. Im immigration is usually a process wherein you legally obtain residence uh, over time in, in a country, right? Illegal immigrant okay, yeah. is one of these, um, like like we, uh, somebody who's in a house without permission is a squatter or a home invader or something like that. But we wouldn't call them an, an illegal homeowner, right? And, and, and this is not to nag at you; it's just to nag at the phrase itself. Uh, an immigrant is an immigrant is illegal, and I know this is. I was like you; I was carried over in a sense from England to Canada when I was eleven. So um, it is. Uh, you weren't an immigrant, right? You were. You were brought over, and you guys, your, your parents were were criminally occupying the United States, right? Right. Yes, I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. Yeah, and and this is no no disrespect to you, when right? You were six, right? Uh, and and right. the fact that you have a conscience and sensitivity about it is a, a very very positive sign. But um, what was it like as the child of illegal immigrants uh, for you? growing up? I mean, I assume that you went to regular school and all that kind of stuff, but what was all that like? Um, well, I, um, obviously, when I was young, uh, quite young, I, I didn't really have any uh, sort of cognizance of it. I, um, I wasn't really aware of it. I guess I probably began, began to, to, to really uh, become aware of that um, when I uh, was probably around 14 or 15. Um, you know, um, because I was rather different and I didn't really grow up in, um, you know, with uh, maybe the right kind of parents or the kind, the right kind of uh, guidance or whatever. Um, I maybe didn't realize because I didn't have that many friends as a child, right? Uh, were, you in a, sorry to interrupt, were you in an area, and of course we don't want to get anywhere specific, but were you in an area where there weren't a lot of other 
um, N- illegal no, there, people. Sorry, no, there were, there were definitely there were. Uh, yeah, there were very many, uh, very many um, uh, Latino, especially uh, immigrants. Um, but sorry, there, I, there were yeah. there were lots of others, or weren't? I'm sorry if I missed that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, there were. There were. Okay. Now, I, yeah, so, so why do you think that you weren't able to, I mean, I have a theory, but I don't want to <laughs> tell you your own experience. Why do you think that you weren't able to sort of gather more of a social circle of friends? Um, well, I guess the, there may be some, um, some inherent uh, qualities. I mean, I'm, I'm very much kind of a loner. I'm very uh, introspective. I think I have been since I was a child. Now, that may not be inherent. I mean, that, that may have a lot to do with my parents and, my, and my, uh, the way that I was brought up. But... Um, yeah, I was always just very, very much a loner, uh, very much kept to myself, um, uh, even as a, as a child, you know. Um, I've always been quite creative, uh, so I'm, I'm more of a, you know, um, much more of an introvert. Um, so, so maybe that, and do you have you any know, uh, Do you have any thoughts as to why? Because you're kind of just describing the same thing over and over again, that you were a loner. Oh, why? Um, okay, yeah, um, I guess there was a lot of uh, sort of isolation in my uh, first years, in my formative years. Um, in the sense that I have one sibling, I have a sister, she's six years older than I am, but she is deaf mute, so there wasn't very much of a, of a connection there. Um, and, what, and she was that way from birth? Yes, she was, yes. Uh, so that and um, I guess just the, 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 that change and just uh, that, that culture, I mean, just being like introduced into a completely new culture, a new language, I guess those first few years before I learned uh, English in the United States at the taxpayer's expense, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I think that had a lot to do with the fact that I, that I didn't um, interact with other kids. I mean, even, but you know, you, you bring up a point that I actually haven't given too much thought to. I don't know why I didn't interact with more Latinos if there were a lot of Latinos around me. Um, that, that's a good point, and it's, it's not something that I've thought about very much. Would you like to hear a theory? Yeah, please, please. <laughs> do you know what the average IQ is in Mexico? Yes, I do. I think it's 85. Uh, 88, in fact. Oh, okay. Again, maybe there's some variation, but um, did, did you ever get tested? Uh, no. Uh, do you think no, there are a lot no. of listeners to this show with an IQ of 88? Um, no, probably not. <laughs> no, I would say definitely not. Um, although based on the typing in some of the YouTube comments, one, <laughs> one could make the case. But uh, no, you were very smart, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I mean, mean, you may be so I, smart that you wouldn't have much in common with not necessarily just Mexicans or, or Hispanics, but, but people in general, <laughs> like any sort of race or ethnicity and so on, you may be uh, that, that smart, right? I hadn't thought of that that way no but you know it's curious um there's when i was in the fourth grade i think um there was this uh test um that i took um i don't it might have been an iq test but anyway after that test i was put into a special program for like gifted and talented kids Mm -hmm. um but i always felt i always thought that it was more of an artistic thing because i don't know i think that test probably picked up on on my creativity um no i was uh yeah i was i was i mean uh for what it's worth, I was sort of pushed ahead in a wide variety. I was so far advanced in my reading and writing in particular that I was given a curtained off area to just do whatever I wanted when I was in school in England. Um, I could just pick any book and just read and write and do whatever I wanted. Then nobody bothered to try and teach me and nobody, um, like I was just, and it was one other kid sort of sometimes was in there with me. And um, yeah, then when I was in Canada, uh, in grade eight, I went into a grade 13 writing class and uh i mean so um in this is back when they tried to accommodate smart people i don't know if they really are doing that as much anymore but uh yeah you you just may be you know and i'm sure are you know extremely intelligent and that is a challenge it's a challenge for socializing horizontally right right yes again i had never thought of that but it makes a lot of sense well i'm not shocking you with the iq stuff right no, you know, I've always kind of thought, not always, but recently, I've kind of thought that I've probably at the like 110, 115 range. I've never taken a test, though. And you don't need to. And nothing's more boring than people who talk about their IQ scores 
and it doesn't hugely matter. Like, it, and, and this IQ stuff, I mean, there's lots of exceptions, right? I mean, um, gosh, what was it? Muhammad Ali had an IQ, I don't know, high 70s or something, but, um, you know, had a willpower and a charisma and so on that made him uh, able to achieve some pretty fantastic stuff. And I, I, Einstein's IQ was not super high. And when it comes to leadership, more IQ can sometimes be a deficiency. Um, you get that, you know, oh, so precious autistic streak or whatever, and uh, it can be a challenge. So uh, higher IQ is interesting and cool, but uh, it's not necessarily the be all and end all. It's not so much. Um, uh, it's not so much the horsepower as the driving that I think matters. And I certainly don't try and speak only for very high IQ people. I mean, I could, but uh, I don't think that's really the, the, the point of philosophy, you know, and I, get, I had these guys, this brothers on trying to talk about sort of reality and, and, and all of this kind of stuff. And, you know, it was pretty complicated and, and I kind of like that in a way, but if you, if you can't break it down to something kids can learn, you're not really doing philosophy. Um, and, and so that's why UPB I practiced explaining it to my kid uh, who now regularly dings me if I'm not UB B compliant, which is good. <laughs> it helps. So yeah, I just I just sort of wanted to point this out because this is what I thought when I was sort of reading your letter and, and talking about it uh, with Mike in preparation for the show. It's kind of what I thought about you've gone back to Mexico. Now, if you were mostly around, I guess, legal or Im illegal Hispanics, and then you went back to Me Mexico, I... I that would be a challenge enough if you were around other kids that were smarter, whether they were Hispanic or not, and then you went back to Mexico. Again, I don't, I don't know, but, but what has it been like for you at the age of 21 deciding to go back? Um, yeah, well, I'm 31 now, so that was 10 years ago. Um, and, well, it's been really tough. I mean, I've, I've really only realized this uh, recently, like within the past year or two. Um, so now I'm taking therapy, which I'm, and I'm actually taking therapy with a Jungian uh, therapist, thanks to, uh, oh. you know, because I heard that you, you had. Uh, so that's working out really well. Um, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, it surprises me to this day that at the age of 21, um, you know, I had this sort of uh, moral sense to to realize that you know I just didn't want uh, didn't want to be there. I, I didn't want to be in that situation. Now that's that's an intelligence test right there, right? Because yeah. you, if I understand this right, and correct me where I go astray. Again, I don't want to explain to you your own life, but look, looking down the road and saying, okay, this could be my next sixty years, is being illegal or you know praying for some sort of path to citizenship or something. So you looking over the hill, in a sense, and looking and, and trying to figure out the consequences and making a big life change for something that was more in line with legality, something more in, in line with legitimacy, something like that, that to me is an intelligence test right there that, that puts you in, in a very high bracket. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, that makes sense. You know, and when I first realized that uh, how, how tough it was going to be for me to to work in the U.S. and to try to try and do any of the things that I really wanted to do, you know, I think I must have been like 15 or 16, and that uh, that drove me to a depression that lasted for you know, I mean, it, I, I'm still uh, suffering from that depression. I think um, it was it was awful. Um, so because yeah, I mean, if if you're going to just be a, I don't know. This is a cliche, and I apologize for the stereotype, but, you know, if you're just going to be a maid or a gardener for the rest of your life, it's not like it's disastrous to not be a citizen, so to speak. But, you know, if you want to start really exercising your intelligence, you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to be a professional, you want to be a business owner and so on, boom, right, you're, you're hitting a pretty significant barrier. Right, yes. Um, yeah. So at the age of 20, 21, I mean, I guess maybe, maybe like five years after um, I realized this, yeah, I just came to the conclusion that I had to leave. Um, and, you know, this was against the wishes of my family, particularly my mother. You know, I remember like other family members, you know, just asking me like what I was thinking <laughs> when I uh, was considering moving back to the third world, as they called it themselves, wow. you know, uh, and I was like, well, I, I, I want to be free, you know, I want to be able to work uh, and whatever I want without feeling that, you know, without this illegality, you know, without... Uh, and do your parents uh, work? Are they on welfare? I mean, what? how do they survive in this? Because, you know, and I got to tell you, I mean, for me, <laughs> let, let's make it about me, right? But, and the, the reason I'm saying this is that when I first heard about uh, uh, immigration 
uh, illegal immigration or this squatting or whatever you want to call it, this invasion, then I, th you know, living in the shadows since I, could th I thought, you know, you had to kind of live under a bridge and, and you couldn't go to a hospital and you couldn't go to school and you couldn't like, you, no way could you ever get welfare. And like, that would be insane because you're illegal, right? Because I had this, I don't know, British waspy relationship to legal and illegal and so on, right? So for me, like being an uh, illegal squatter in a country and being able to go to school is like, well, drugs are illegal, but you can open a heroin store. And like, well, which is it? Like, what, what's the plan here? And so that is something that I learned over time that, uh, and this is even before the sanctuary cities and so on. Like, I remember when I first learned that illegal immigrants very often can just get welfare and they actually have a right to do so. I'm just like, what? <laughs> why is there a law? I mean, why, why create this? Like, I don't understand. Why create this ghetto? And so on. So, um, yeah, so that's why I would ask, I mean, how did your parents um, put a roof over their heads and yours? Oh, well, that's, I mean, that's definitely one of the things that I wanted to shed some light on. I mean, um, it, I, I suppose it depends on what's part of the U.S. Um, but where I was, uh, there was definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of illegal immigrants and a lot of Latinos. And, uh, you know, it was not very hard at all. I mean, um, at all, honestly, uh, you know, nobody asked. Uh, nobody really made a, a, a I mean, I, I Again, I didn't realize this till I was quite, um, you know, like 15 or 16. So it's definitely not a problem. And I mean, you can definitely work. And and certainly, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know what percentage of the kids in my school were illegal, but it must have been a pretty, you know, pretty big chunk of the, uh, the school population, um, which is which is really awful. Um, well, because you know, it's not like, I, I mean, if it. your parents are illegal, I assume they're not paying a lot of property taxes or anything. So that cost just gets passed along to the uh, to taxpayer. Yeah, that's that's awful, and I, I really hope that I can do something to repay the taxpayer someday. It's uh, well, again, not your fault. Yeah. You were a kid, right? Right. You're not morally right. responsible for for that particular choice. What are you going to hitchhike back when you're eight? I mean, you know, <laughs> that that I have no no moral qualms with you whatsoever. Your parents are another matter, but you know. Right. Just to get to the specifics of, of your question. Um, well, yeah, my mother worked uh, mostly doing cleaning. You know, like cleaning. Um, whether it be uh, like restaurants or bars or uh, you know other people's homes, uh, that's the way we we uh, well she uh, she she got us through. Um, and she, you know, my my father wasn't actually there. My father uh, he um, he lived in in the U.S. for some time. I mean, my my, my parents uh, were separated when I was six, so my my mother basically left my father when I was six and moved to oh, the so, U.S. With us. Okay, so she she was in Mexico. She left Mexico with you. So not only were there squatting. Uh, but there's also single mom squatting too. Oh yeah, Excellent. yeah, definitely. Excellent. So I'm a, I do connect, I connected uh, quite quite a bit with your last caller. Uh, in I terms hope not of too that. much. Oh no, I mean just the the contents of the call. All right, all right. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, my father wasn't there. He was there for a couple of years, and he was deported, and I couldn't see him. But um, wait, so you your, know, your father did come over for a couple of years? Yeah, he was he was in the U.S. for for a few years, right. um, and then and then his his visa was revoked and. He, he wasn't able to go back. Um, right. So pre, pre yeah, Obama, I mean, pre Obama, I guess. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, it's not it's not difficult. It's not difficult to live over there as a US, as, as an illegal, or it didn't used to be. Hopefully, it will be now with uh, with Donald Trump. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean that. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about this and. Actually, actually, I was just reading recently about um, a lot of uh, Central Americans being deported, along with Mexicans, to uh, to 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 this side of the border, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and you know, I just I felt so uh, so so saddened, you know, hearing about people who probably spent maybe not the Central Americans, but but maybe some some of the uh, Mexican um, immigrants who were there. Um, you know, they may have spent most of their lives there. They may not speak any Spanish. They they may, you know, um, I mean, this may be a completely new culture to them, as it was to me. Um, and it's, you know, when I think of, like, who's to blame, is it the people, I mean, is it the people that are trying to get them out? Well, no. I mean, it's obviously the people who let them in in the first place. Um, no, no, it's the people who moved illegally in the first place. I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to pick on your parents, 
But okay. it's, it's not the people who refuse to get them out. I mean, that's bad, obviously, in my opinion. Right? Uh -huh. I have a law, I don't have a law, but having a law and not enforcing it degrades the entire culture. Uh, but um, no, I mean, you, your, your mom said, I'm going to the States. She knew it was illegal. She knew it was a criminal action. She knew that she was going to be preying upon the taxpayers. Uh, and she just went ahead and did it anyway. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, I agree with you that, uh, there. But now, I think don't, what I get, don't get me wrong. I would have much less problem, much less problem with illegal immigration if there was no welfare state, if there was complete freedom of association and all that kind of stuff, if there were no government schools, like all, if it was pay your own way, I really, really would have a tough time getting bothered by the whole thing. But given that there is a welfare state and government education and all that kind of stuff, sorry, you know, domestic population has a right to have the money to raise their own kids rather than shoveling it you know, by the barrel full to, to other cultures, other people, other races, other whoever, it doesn't really matter. It could be the same damn race. It doesn't matter to me. But, you know, people who are in a country whose ancestors built that country, who are paying taxes in that country, do have the right to keep some of that money for themselves so they can have their own kids, maintain their own culture, their own country. Uh, and um, I hope people can at least understand that it, my objection fundamentally is with government intervention domestically that then causes problems with immigration. I just wanted to mention that because it get people, get, get this sort of stuff out of the way. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I totally agree. Um, I think what I meant was more just not, not so much um, not getting them out, but letting them in in the first place, like, you know, with the lax borders and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, they just made it so easy for people to, or they make it so easy for people to, you know, for, for all the reasons you've stated before. Um, and obviously, yes, my mother's to blame. Um, I mean, I, 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 I see that for sure. But uh, you know, I still if feel somebody like if somebody leaves a, a wallet on a bench, you still don't justify the thief. Well, it was so easy, you know. <laughs> still a thief, right? Right. Now I don't know what you would think. Uh, how would you would factor the uh, the, the IQ uh, into that? Um, I mean, maybe uh, you know, if there's a park with if she's uh, if she's smart enough, if she's smart enough to cross over and make a go of it, then she's smart enough to understand the ethics of the situation. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, I mean, it's it's not called uh, illegal for. <laughs> I mean, it's called illegal for a reason, right? Oh yeah, no, I mean, you know, try try being an American and don't pay your taxes and see whether you get a sanctuary city or not. Probably not. And I, let me just make a quick rant here too. I'm going to try not to wedge okay. it in, and we'll have time to talk afterwards. But uh huh. If everyone who wants a better and freer life leaves Mexico and comes to America, Mexico will never be free. Mexico will never improve. I mean, there may be limits based on national IQ and all that kind of stuff, but dear God alive, there are very smart, very brilliant people in Mexico who could be fighting the good fight and trying to make Mexico a better place and writing their articles and educating people about freedom and liberty and personal responsibility and property rights and free markets and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I know I went down to give a speech in Brazil. It was a great group of guys down there doing wonderful work educating people about the free market. So there could be all of this wonderful stuff happening in Mexico, but because everybody just goes to America who wants to be free, what happens? Well, the countries that they're leaving never get free, which means that more people go to America, which means there are fewer freedom-loving people or people who want a better life in the host country. Which means more people, you understand, this cycle can't end except when the last productive person leaves, I don't know, say, Venezuela. And then everyone starves to death together. I mean, I understand it. You've got to stay and fight. That's a challenging thing. And, you know, I, I can understand why people want to do that. Well, I just want a better life for me and my kids and so on. It's like, yeah, but if everybody makes that decision, then you actually don't get that better life for your kids. Because what happens is rather than stay and fight for freedom in your own country, everybody swarms to America, overburdens the welfare system, collapses government finances, and then guess what? You left Mexico because it was kind of a crap hole, and you just turned America into a crap hole, except now there ain't no place to go. All right. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. No, I agree with that completely. And that's a big part of my, uh, of, of my question, of my concern. Um, and the things that have been going through my mind lately are just so strange <laughs> because I, uh, you know, in a way I kind of identified or, or started to identify as an American in, in the United States. And, you know, then I'm brought over here and, 
you know, I went through a very difficult period in which, you know, I didn't really want to accept the fact that I was in Mexico and that I was, you know, that I was stuck here, that, that I was, that, and that I was born here and that I belonged here in a way. Um, but, you know, I've been listening to all of this, especially with Donald Trump, for example. I, uh, you know, I followed his, um, his campaign and his eventually, eventual victory, and I was very excited about that. And uh, I've been following some of the meme stuff, and I just think it's hilarious. And it's, uh, and it's very fun, you know. It's exciting. Um, it's exciting to, to see that kind of uh, um, excitement, you know, in that community um, uh, for, for, their, for their new leader, right, and, and the possibilities of that. So, um, but then I asked myself, you know, um, I don't have any place in, in that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an American. Um, so it, it kind of put me at, in, in an odd uh, place where I kind of had to come to terms with the fact that, you know, yeah, nationalism sounds like it can have some very positive effects and it can be a very positive thing. Um, and now it's, it's my turn to, to accept in a way that um, I am Mexican and that perhaps, you know, the best thing that I can do is, is accept that I'm Mexican and try to work towards the betterment of my own country um, and not worry about you know, as fun as whatever's happening in the, in the U.S. maybe. Well, here's, yeah, um, here's the thing. I think immigration is a challenge. Because of human biodiversity, uh, immigration is a challenge. Because of cultural incompatibilities, immigration is a challenge. And I've gone back and forth on this so many times, so I'm not going to bore you with all the back and forth. But the one thing, the one thing that is required for immigration to succeed is for a self-confident host culture then immigration can succeed if america had a self-confident host culture and it doesn't because it's been eaten from the root up by leftists and globalists and communists and socialists to be you know racist and sexist and homophobic and killed all the indians and you know like it the 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 the, the host culture has been crippled and turned into a sort of self-loathing caricature of its former confidence and this is true all throughout the West. You cannot have successful immigration into a self-loathing host culture. Because there's nothing to assimilate to, you understand? It all just balkanizes, everything just fragments. There's no dominant culture belief system, ideology, philosophy, whatever you want to call it, there's no dominant mind system that allows people to integrate into a cohesive whole society. Now, in the 19th century, America had enormous amounts of self-confidence, as did uh, England, and there was immigration and emigration and so on. And you were damn well expected to conform and comply. And of course, in a sense, you had to because there was no welfare state. So you had to integrate economically or you just couldn't survive. And as I've mentioned before, a third of people from Europe who moved to America in the 19th century ended up moving back because they didn't like it. So if you have, like Japan has a self-confident host culture. You go to Japan, you try and lecturing them about their racism, they'll just laugh and kick you on the next boat out. If you have a self-confident host culture, then you can have immigration. Like, it's sort of like if you, you can have a healthy relationship with someone if you have a positive self-image and you're self-confident and expressive and, and honest. And like then you, but if you're some sort of self-loathing, codependent, narcissistic, you know, whatever, masochistic, then you can't have a healthy relationship. If you yourself are not healthy, you can't have a healthy relationship. And if the host culture is sick and is self-loathing and has been turned against itself, then it cannot have a healthy relationship with its immigrants. The immigrants will look at it with contempt, will not want to join a self-loathing culture. Can you imagine? Can you imagine saying to Hispanics, well, you've got to come and be like Americans. What? Divided about race, self-hating, self-loathing, you know, at war with yourself. Like, I don't want any of that. And so... And this, of course, is the point. If you cripple the host culture and invite a lot of other cultures in, you shatter the cohesiveness of the country, you get multiculturalism, which is where there's no dominant culture, everything breaks up, fragments, becomes tribal, sets against each other. And this particularly happens along IQ lines, along racial lines, along ethnicity lines, along cultural lines. So if you don't have a healthy, cohesive, self-respecting host culture, it doesn't mean it can't be improved or anything like that, then you're like um, a crazy codependent trying to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You, 
you may end up in a relationship, but it sure as hell won't be healthy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Say, so why doesn't immigration work in the 19th century? Yep, no welfare state and a very confident host culture that expected assimilation and did not enforce it, but expected it. And um, there was a certain amount of ostracism of people who wouldn't integrate. And that's not the case anymore. The welfare state means you don't have to integrate and a self-contempting, self-hating host culture means that nobody wants to join that team anyway, right? So, right. and this, yeah, this issue around, I had, so I, I had a, a friend years ago who would tell me about the challenges of being an immigrant, not really noticing that I myself was an immigrant or was brought over as an immigrant family in an immigrant family. But, um, and she said there's this like in-betweenness, there's this lostness. You're not part of the culture you've come to, you're not part of the culture you left. And something I've noticed is this, the bubble, the bubble, the immigrant bubble. And what happens, of course, is let's say that uh, your parents left Pakistan, you know, 40 years ago or 30 years ago, right? Well, they took a little bubble of Pakistan over with them to wherever they are now, let's just say England, right? So for 30, 40 years ago, they left Pakistan and brought the little bubble of Pakistan from 40 years ago to England. Could, could happen the other way. I mean, just go this way. Now, what happens is Pakistan changes and grows. But the little bubble you bring over doesn't. Because it's not subject to the same forces. It's not subject to the same economic decisions, the same political decisions, the same demographic pressures or anything like that. And so you bring a bubble of frozen culture over with you and it never thaws. And your kids are growing up in a little bu bubble of Pakistan from 40 years ago. Now, maybe this was the case with you and, and, and your parents, Sebastian, but you grow up in a little bubble that has detached itself from the mothership of Pakistan. And now there's no place to go because that bubble shrinks and pops. But that's what you were raised in. It's this little time capsule of Pakistan from 40 years ago. You go back to Pakistan now, it's nothing like the Pakistan bubble that you grew up in 40 years ago. And of course, your host country is not that way. So you have this in-betweenness, this rootedlessness. Rootlessness? <laughs> this root rootlessness. And I don't know any way to land into a place that feels like home. When the home that you have was detached, frozen, vanished. And there's no place to land where you are. You can't go home. Home isn't where you are. So where are you? Yeah, uh, you touch on something very... Um, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really tough. Uh, definitely, it's, uh, it's very hard. Um, and it's one of the, the issues that I've been uh, dealing with. Um, I actually moved uh, about a year ago when I decided to make all of these changes to a, a community in Mexico with a pretty large expat community, uh, um, population, sorry. Um, Wait, and now I think expat just... is becoming confusing for me at the moment. <laughs> so <laughs> what do you mean by expat with your circumstances? Well, yeah, there's a large community where I live now um, of Americans and Canadians and people from okay. you know all over the world. That I thought you meant people who had uh, grown up in America but who were Hispanic who'd moved back to Mexico. That's why I just want to make sure I understood oh. that. Okay. No, so I think I'm kind of trying to look for that in a way, you know. Um, but I also realized that I have to, um, you know, I have to absorb my own culture and I need to try to uh, find the best within it and and try to make some changes here uh, to, to make my country better. Um, and try yeah. to I, I think you have to, I mean, if you have philosophical values, if, if I wasn't trying to create the world that I want to live in, I wouldn't feel at home anywhere. Because, you know, I mean, everywhere I go, there's some pretty significant elements of statism and collectivism and, and you know, acceptance of spanking or, you know, some combination of those things in sort of very indifferent slider bars. And so because I don't feel at home anywhere I go, I have to create a home everywhere I go, which is on the internet. And I have to create the kind of world that I want to live in because I don't feel that my values or rational values are matched anywhere in the world at the moment. So I'm creating a little slice of the future and letting it pour in. 
Yes, I think my, my own life um, has basically led me to, to the same thing. Um, I, I mean, my, my desire f- uh, to, to learn more about philosophy and, uh, and ultimately d- dedicate my life uh, to it probably has a lot to do with that, with um, me, me seeking a, a home of some sort. Right. Right. And I think another challenge for immigrants um, in the West at the moment is, is the racist card is um, the great weakness of Western immigration. Again, I can't imagine going to Japan or, or the Philippines or anywhere with some other culture or race and, you know, sitting down and bitching at them about their culture and bitching at them about their treatment of, of me and crying out that they were racist and, and so on. I mean, it, it would just, to me, that's incomprehensible. And racism... So people say, well, it worked in the 19th century. It was like, yeah, well, yeah, because people in the 19th century came almost exclusively from Europe. And if you come from Europe, there may be regional conflicts, but you're all Caucasians. And so there's no screaming of racism at people in the 19th century. I mean, yeah, people didn't like the Irish, and there were certainly tensions with some Chinese and all that. But there wasn't the great scream of racism. And I would be much more comfortable with different races intermixing and intermingling if, and I don't know how to avoid this, but if there wasn't this constant screaming of racism. Until that is no longer a giant factor in the massive reallocation and, uh, of resources in society, I don't know how immigration of different races is going to work until the racism card stops working. And I don't know how... <laughs> when or how the racism card is going to stop working, given what I know about human biodiversity. I mean, it's not nearly as much fun moving to the West if you don't get a big racist card, like to be called calling people racist, calling whites racist, and so on. It's, you know, because you get a lot of resources, right? You'll get government grants, government loans, preferential entrances if you're part of certain demographic groups into universities, and, and you'll get, you know, affirmative action hiring and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, at the expense of the native population, and this is true for uh, native blacks in some ways as well. So it is, uh, it, it is a challenge, you know, until people are willing to give up the racist card. You're a racist, there's ever racism, is racist, race, race, race. I don't know how we're supposed to have a colorblind society if everyone keeps screaming racism. Well, when I say everyone, I mean non-whites uh, mostly and, and, you know, Hispanics and uh, and uh, and blacks. Screaming racism all the time, it's like, okay, well, this means that it can't work because if everyone's screaming racism all the time at whites and now to some degree at, at East Asians, um, okay, well, that's why it worked in the 19th century because it was all one race, different cultures, different countries, different languages, but one race. Well, because, and, and again, it's nothing inherent. It's just that as long as the leftists allow, allow us, or once, as long as the leftists continue to encourage us dividing ourselves and screaming racist at each other and suppressing information about human biodiversity, it's not going to work. But then the reality is multiculturalism as it stands, and diversity as it stands, is not designed to work. It's not designed to work. Any more than the welfare state is designed to work. It's designed to divide and to fragment and to destroy. Right, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I actually, uh, I feel... Um Right now, I'm staying with a Catholic family, for example, um, and, you know, I don't share any of their uh, customs. I don't know uh, all of these things. And, you know, I, I feel like an outsider with them, although I am Mexican. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I definitely understand how... Uh, but are homogenous... you Mexican? I mean, that's an interesting question. You left when you were <laughs> six. Are you Mexican? And And Mexican, of course, you can't... I guess you could adopt, right? Mestizo is one thing. Mexican is another. Catholic is another, right? Anyone can become Catholic if they're willing to go through the process. Uh, it's pretty tough to become a Mexican, and you can transition into Hispanic or a Mestizo, right? I mean, you, you, you just can't. I mean, no matter what people say about social constructs and all that kind of stuff, biologically, you can't, right? And so, yeah, these are all very, very challenging. And so my suggestion, and I know you haven't asked Renny other than, I guess, obliquely in your, your email, but my suggestion is you don't get culture, I'm afraid. You don't, you don't get it. And, and that's a shame in some ways, and it's a great gift in another. And if it's any consolation, I don't get culture either. 
And what I mean is, I don't, I don't mean I don't understand it. I mean, it's just not a, it's not, not a present that I get. It's not an identity that I get. I can't be a, whatever it is, right? A Canadian, a, a, you know, I, I, I can't, I just, legally I am. And there's lots of things I like about uh, Canada and it's a pretty great place to live compared to most of the world. So, you know, all of that having been said, but when you're a philosopher, you don't get culture. That's just not a gift that you get. Doesn't mean you can't admire it, uh, which, which I do. It doesn't, in some ways, doesn't mean you can't uh, improve it. It doesn't mean you can't attempt to bring culture closer to reason and evidence. But sorry, it's just not something you get when you think for yourself. Because culture is a way of offloading reasoning into history. It's, it's a way of offloading habit and decisions into history and tradition and momentum which is fine. Again, I used to have more problems with it uh, until I saw the alternatives, which was nihilism. You know, most people, when they detach from culture, they don't become philosophical. They become hedonistic, nihilistic, materialistic, empty, and uh, cowardly and um, cucky. So what I would say is if you're going to do the reason and evidence thing, and it kind of sounds like you are, then you just have to commit to that. Philosophy has to become your country. Philosophy has to become your culture. And that means you'll always have a home wherever you go but that home won't be prefabricated for you. You'll have no house to move into. You must build your own and you must build it enough for lots of people to live there. Hopefully, eventually, at some point, the whole damn world. But you have to be an explorer. You cannot be a settler. You have to be a builder. You cannot be a move into her, <laughs> right? Um, and, and through the inspiration and act of building and of exploring and of creating, you can transfer the methodology of philosophy to other people through inspiration and example and teaching. And then we can begin to spread this new country called reason, this new culture called philosophy. But we cannot live in the houses of our fathers when we've been kicked out of history by philosophy. We must build a new world. We must explore the new planet of reason and evidence and invite others to come and live with us because we don't breathe that air anymore. We're high up on the mountains. We don't breathe the sea air anymore. It's too thick for us. It makes us cough. We must invite people up to the rarefied air and the glorious views of the snowy capped mountains of far vision, of deep thinking, of universalism. We can't live where they are. We can invite them up to where we are. And that way we get thin air, a great view, and very, very invigorating weather. <laughs>